Great. Perfect, perfect. Okay, so we're pretty much at maximum capacity for the webinar, so we'll make a start, although we're about 30 seconds early. Um, but yeah, we're ready to go. So first of all, thank you so much uh, for spending your Monday evening learning about Perio. That's a uh, pure dedication. Um, and someone said you can't can hear but not see you. Okay. Any other ones? Ah. Okay. Let me just try and fix the sound. Okay, is that any better? Yep. Everyone can see me and hear me. Is that correct? All good. Okay, fine. Okay, great. So make a start. So um, this webinar is called Perio in Practice, and it's targeted for both uh, general dental practitioners as well as hygienists. Um, it's great to see so many of you from all over the world, not just England as well. I think that's the beauty of webinars, we can actually connect worldwide, which is fantastic. So the title of this webinar is Perio in Practice, Plaque, Probing, Planing, Prescribing and Planning. So a lot of keys. <laughs> Um, hopefully uh, it should be very interesting and useful to you. So um, it's about an hour long and it's going to be divided into um, five sections and after each section I was thinking of stopping for about a minute or two if you've got questions relevant to each of the P's then we'll go through it at that point. So that's the way we'll go through it. So um, as a dental student um, when you learn about perio and you're sitting in class talking about pockets and gums and even on clinic, I think it can be quite dull. And I have to say that as a dental student, I don't think I found perio that interesting at all. So um, it was only until postgrad that I found it interesting. So the general concerns about perio is how it's boring. Um, and then you go out into practice and can talk be even better um, or get better when I go into practice. And then you go into practice and you have this image in your head that you're going to be you know, uh, driving around these Ferraris and seeing all these patients and making lots and lots of money. But in reality, um, Perio doesn't get any better in practice. In fact, sometimes it gets even harder uh, to perform good periodontal treatment. So most GEPs, uh, at least in the UK, um, don't find Perio uh, very attractive. And there's various reasons for it, um, mainly because of the constraints of the system here. So. You may not enjoy perio, you may not find it exciting, but is it actually important? Um, so let's go through a few figures to set the scene of this webinar. Some people are still saying they can't uh, hear. I'm hoping that most people can. There's, no one, there's only a couple of people who have said that in the box. I'm going to carry on. Any major issues, just uh, obviously lots of people start typing. Um, okay, so um, it may not be everyone's favorite subject, but is it important? So let's try and establish some facts and figures to, to tell ourselves if it is important or not. So first of all, periodontitis is the most common disease of humans. Interestingly, severe disease affects about 11.2% of the world population, and that makes it the sixth most prevalent human condition, which is huge. Nearly half of adults in England have periodontitis. That's approximately 24 million people, according to the Adult Dental Health Survey. So when you do a back of an envelope calculation, that means each dentist, on average, will be seeing about 800 patients with periodontitis. So that is a lot of patients. Um, so number one, it's very common, okay? But not only that, if you start looking at the evidence and the papers that have been coming out, there's more and more studies to show that it affects quality of life and there's a strong uh, association uh, with general health as well, especially some conditions more than others. Um, but this link, the systemic link is getting stronger and stronger. So it's common, okay? It's a public health problem because it affects quality of life and it's associated with uh, general health. And number three, it's on, top, it's on the top of the list in terms of litigation. Um, if you look at figures in terms of the, the one specialty where uh, most GDPs are sued against its period. So 
even if you don't like it, you may not enjoy it, it is really important to get good at it. Um, so I hope in the next hour or so I can share a few tips that I've learned over the last few years through my specialty training, through teaching hygienists and also working in general practice. I hope I can use everything that I've learned to share a few things which are working for me and hopefully can work for you so you can make perio more enjoyable, um, but more importantly, uh, you, you get really good at it in general practice. So the learning outcomes of today are to share um, tips on providing effective oral hygiene in the time available in practice, because as we know, in practice we're limited with time, um, but we know oral hygiene structure is important. So how do you provide effective oral hygiene advice, not just oral hygiene, hygiene advice? Number two, um, to understand the um, BPE guidelines. Number three, to discuss the importance of probing around implants. There's a big um, Change the mic to the other one. There's a big um, question mark over people still saying, oh, should I probe, should I not? Is it dangerous? Should I use a plastic probe? So I just want to um, uncover a few of those myths. Uh, number four, to share tips on providing effective root surface debridement using hand instruments or ultrasonic scalars, so a bit of pl um, planing. Number five, to provide an overview on possible indications for prescribing antibiotics. And um, number six, to share some general treatment planning tips and also just go over a few things for those who are um, general dentists working under the NHS. Um, when do you claim for a, a band one? When do you claim for a band two? So all of those kinds of things. So uh, essentially we're talking about plaque, probing, planing, prescribing and then some planning and each is about 10 minutes long. So let's get started. First of all, plaque, okay, so giving effective oral hygiene advice. So I tried to put a few comics or cartoons along the way just to keep you all awake because I know <laughs> it, otherwise it can get a little bit dull. So I hope you enjoy them. So, and I should also mention some of these doodles, like the one on the lower right side here, um, they're drawn by one of my colleagues called Gemma Ball. She's a fantastic cartoonist. She's actually a dental nurse, but she also does some drawings for me. So um, I have to acknowledge her for that. She does a great job. Anyway. Providing um, oral hygiene advice. So why is it important, first of all, for our patients to have optimal oral hygiene? Well, first of all, good oral hygiene is important to prevent uh, two of the most prevalent conditions being uh, periodontitis and caries. But also, and quite importantly, it optimizes the chances of successful treatment. So if you want to do fancy composites, if you want to do um, veneers and crowns, they're not going to look good if you've got bleeding gums, unless you want pink composites. So it's really important just generally for the success of any treatment that you do. Also, long-term long stability. If your patient can't maintain good oral hygiene, the work and the effort that you do, and the patient's obviously time, money, etc., it's not going to last. So you want that predictability, and for that, you need good patient compliance and good uh, oral hygiene. So it's, first of all, really important. So how do we actually, and, okay, this picture is just to illustrate, you wouldn't want to do composites um, or veneers on someone with teeth like this, with plaque everywhere. It's not gonna work, um, and you know it's not gonna look great either. So it's in everyone's favor to get our patients to have optimal oral hygiene. So um, I just wanna start with telling you a little story. So when I started, um, VT, which is vocational training, it's the first year in practice in England as you go out into practice. Um, I was really enthusiastic. I still think I'm enthusiastic, but I was super enthusiastic. So my, I think it was the first couple of days, I had a patient who came in, I was sitting in my chair, sweet little old lady came in, sat down, um, and uh, it was time for some oral hygiene advice because she was a perio patient, and I thought, right, Let's get, you know, let's get back to what I used to do in dental school. So I got my models out, got my toothbrush, I got um, my TPs, I got everything I needed. Um, and I started with the toothbrush. I got my model and I said, look, here's a toothbrush. And we're going to be talking about giving, you know, talking about having good oral hygiene. This is a toothbrush. You have to hold it at 45 degrees to the gums in a modified bath technique. And I demonstrated it, went all the way around, showed the importance of, you know, going right lingually and palatally, um, two minutes per quadrant. And I was so confused. I literally went on for about five, six minutes. It was actually a long time in practice. 
So, and the lady was just smiling and nodding the whole time. So I thought, yeah, she's completely getting it. And then, um, after I did the whole, you know, whole spiel, I said to her, so, Mrs. Smith, you know, you've completely got that right. And she just said, oh, sorry, I didn't understand anything that you said. And I looked at her and I was just like, oh, my God. So you could have stopped me halfway. You were smiling and nodding all the way through, but you had no idea what I was talking about. So from that day, I learned that patients, you know, things we take for granted, like 45 degrees and holding the bristles along the gum margin, they really don't understand it unless you orientate them. You have to have to have to keep it as simple as possible. Otherwise, you're totally wasting your time. So the first thing I can say to you is just orientate the patient, just basic orientation. This is the tooth, this is the gum, this is where you're trying to clean. Because if you don't do that, patients will get lost from the word go. So how do I do that? Well, simple as, you don't need any special technology. If you've just got a mirror, um, pull the lip back and say, look, this is your tooth, this is your gum. It might sound obvious to us, but actually to the patient, it might not be so obvious. So this is the tooth, this is the gum. And then I normally just get my probe and place it in the pocket or along the gingival margin. I say, see this space? This is where we're trying to clean. So the, br the bristles on your brush, um, that's the angle that you need to go towards, not 45 degrees modified backs, because they won't understand that. So simple as uh, just showing them in the mirror. You can also, if you've got an intraoral camera, you can take some photos. Um, that can be helpful, even for things like bleeding and showing them calculus, saying, look, this is what happens when you don't perform effective oral hygiene. Um, and you see some of the faces when they see the, the lingual wall of calculus. So some people just have no idea that it's there. So you can use that. Um, or you can use radiographs. So um, for radiographs, what I normally do, I get a piece of paper and then I cover up um, where the gingival margarine would be, and then I'll pull it back down and I say, look, see all these deposits? That's where we're trying to clean. So it just gives them a better idea in their head um, in terms of orientation. So number one, orientate them before you do anything else. Number two, um, my tip for oral hygiene advice is disclose. Okay, so every time I talk about disclosing, most people say, oh, well, that takes some time. But trust me, when you get into the routine of it, it actually honestly takes about less than a minute. By the time the patient choose up the tablet, and I do prefer tablet rather than the liquid, I just think it's more effective, um, but do put some Vaseline on the lips, of those that go purple, and I've gotten in trouble for that in, in the past, so um, chew up the tablet, gentle rinse out, literally takes less than a minute, and it's so effective. Um, it provides a clear visual illustration, because we say to the patient, you know, sometimes plaque is, um, sometimes plaque is invisible, so this will help us stain up where you're missing, and when the patient actually can see for themselves where they're missing, it's quite powerful. It can give you the opportunity to provide tailored oral hygiene advice. Hopefully your patients don't look like this photo here um, and there's just sp specific spots that they're missing, but this will help you identify those areas. I've started uh, um, taking photos on, because everyone obviously has a smartphone, taking photos of the disclosed areas um, on their camera phone, which is a useful reminder when they go home. Um, obviously the whole point of having Disclose, uh, disclosing plaque is so that you can calculate a plaque score. Okay, so um, you can do that on whatever software you use, but a plaque score and having an objective measurement um, is much better than just saying oral hygiene fair, oral hygiene good, oral hygiene poor, because what does that actually mean? Um, so during my perio special training, they talk, we're not allowed to use good, fair, and poor. Um, you have to use percentages. And I think that's actually much more powerful than saying fair, because fair is it's, it's anyone's opinion that can be fair. Um, but if you've got a percentage, um, that's more effective. If you are short of time, you can use, um, you don't have to disclose and you can just use your probe or a partial recording index, but that's not ideal in terms of um, what we're trying to achieve. Also, I've just put here medico legally, um, it's important because. Now, for example, if you if your patient keeps having 80% plaque, 80% plaque every single time, or 90%, um, it's not really the ideal environment to start providing aesthetic treatment or composites or crowns because they won't work. But if you then not give the patient the treatment uh, but have no objective measurement over time of that you were checking their plaque scores and just say oral hygiene poor, it doesn't have much of a ground to hold. So. Um, Medically, legally, it's a great thing as well to have in your records. Number three, demonstrate intraorally. So this photo was sent to me by Prof Chapel, um, basically trying to illustrate that we actually demand quite a lot from our patients, and the least that we can do is demonstrate intraorally. 
So after that whole thing happened with that um, little granny I told you about at the beginning, I also got rid of my models because in my opinion, I really don't think they work very well. The best thing to do is to show them in their mouth. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but I've tried both ways and I just think actually showing them in their mouth getting them to see it for themselves, they can feel it, it makes a huge difference. It's, it's much more effective than just showing them on a model because um, it's very hard to relate to that. So what we've started doing in the practice that I work at is sending reminder texts or an email to our patients saying, you know, today's your appointment with a hygienist or the dentist. Um, if it's a pair appointment, say, make sure you bring oral hygiene aid. So they bring it with them so you can show them in the mouth. Um, if they don't have it with them, then we purchase one, uh, they purchase one, and then we use it in their mouth. So um, either way, use something in their mouth, and normally you have some samples of interdental brushes. Um, with the electric toothbrush, I will show you, you can get the test drive from Oral-B, which is fantastic. Uh, and I'm not just saying that because they're sponsoring this webinar, I use it all the time. And I'll show you a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, so it allows patients to demonstrate, you can adapt the technique rather than starting from scratch because you can see what they're doing and what they're going wrong, where they're going wrong. Um, and I, for some patients who find it difficult to remember things, you can also video it on their smartphone, um, especially things like teepees, their specific colours, etc. It's useful to video it and then they can go back and, and have a look. So this is the Oral-B test drive and essentially um, a little sleeve goes onto um, the electric toothbrush, which is then replaced for each patient, and there's a new head each time. Um, and it's fantastic because you can demonstrate. I prefer electric toothbrushes unless they're super good at brushing with manual toothbrushes. Um, and then a lot of patients say, oh, I don't want to bring my toothbrush, huge, um, huge thing. I don't want to carry it around in my bag. It just came from work, etc. So this is great to have in the practice. Um, and if you like one, just if you just contact your B rep, I'm sure they can arrange um, for you to have one in the practice. So definitely recommend that. At this point, I also want to say, um, when they're demonstrating in the mouth, it's also quite useful because it tells you um, whether they're actually genuinely finding it difficult to clean their teeth or they're just genuinely not motivated. So you have to distinguish between these two types. Number one, the non-motivated patient with poor compliance. For this patient, okay, um, we need to push the patient to take some ownership. However, if it's a second type of patient, which you'll be able to pick up when they demonstrate, um, those that are really, really struggling to perform good oral hygiene, it's then our responsibility to try and make it easy for them. And there's things like various handles that you can use um, and um, things to make it easier to, to perform effective oral hygiene. And then it's your responsibility. So um, that's the second type. So demonstrating also allows you to pick up this. Number four, um, you can start, I normally say to my patients who miss the palatal or lingual areas to start there because when you first start brushing, as I'm sure you will know from personal experience, you have the most energy at the beginning. So if you start brushing lingually or palatally, wherever they miss, um, that will ensure that those areas are brushed effectively. Some people go um, as far as to say, use your TPs first. To be honest, it doesn't really matter which order you do it in, but some people say use your TPs first because that's when your patients will have the most energy. So it doesn't matter, but um, that is normally helpful in terms of order. Number five, um, this was a video of a little uh, guy brushing his teeth, but uh, unfortunately the videos haven't embedded. But um, watch out for the overzealous brushes. So although they might not have pockets, they will have loss of attachment and recession. So we also need to look out for these patients. So look out if they're being too aggressive. If you have patients who kind of brush like this, tell them to use a pen grip in, instead and also try brushing with their wrist rather than they normally brush with a whole elbow. Um, so yes, that's a few tips for those types of patients. Number six, um, promote power brushes. Um, where possible. So if your patient is using a manual toothbrush and they're brushing very, very well, that's absolutely fine. There is no need to push them to change. However, most patients don't brush their teeth very well. And in those cases, power brushes can provide um, significantly greater reductions in plaque and gingivitis. And remember, there's two types of power brushes. There's rechargeable and also battery operated. Um, so distinguish between the two and the, the rechargeable ones are better, more effective than the battery operated ones. By the way, um, this is taken from the EFP workshop and I would highly recommend for you guys to read, if you haven't already, um, the findings of this prevention workshop. Basically, um, what it is is a summary 
of consensus guidelines put together by experts, perio experts, um, and it gives you advice on different types of prevention. Um, then there's all different to topics, and each year there's a different topic, and the one coming up actually is on classification because, as you know, that's going to change. Um, but I would definitely, this is where this is from, and I would definitely advise you to read the whole of the guidelines. So that's number six. Number, sorry, number six, um, interdental brushes. Um, I quite like that. Um, Interproximal cleaning is essential for gingival health. Interdental cleaning um, with interdental brushes is most effective method for interproximal plaque removal. So the gold standard here are interdental brushes. Um, flossing, this is taken from the workshop again, flossing cannot be recommended other than for sites of gingival and periodontal health, where interdental brushes will not pass through the interproximal area without trauma. Now, this is where the whole flossing hoo-ha started, when people said flossing, don't promote flossing anymore. That's not true. I think the point is that where the interdental brush fits, use the interdental brush. However, where it doesn't fit or if it's going to cause trauma, flossing still has a place. So there is still a place for floss. However, interdental brushes are the gold standard. This is all about being patient specific. So address it according to each patient. Um, someone's asked a question on air floss, um, water pick pre -tem. Um The current evidence shows that things like the air floss and the water pick, they are very good at removing debris, um, but they're definitely not as good as removing plaque as the interdental brushes. So some patients just love them, so I normally just let my patients carry on as long as they're using the interdental brushes, but it's not a, necess a necessity to have both. Um, definitely interdental brushes. So number seven is GPS, um, not the GPS we use to get home today, but GPS is something which was also taken from this workshop. Uh, as you can see, it was a very productive workshop. Um, and it's a way that you can influence behavior change. So as you know, um, changing behavior is very, very difficult. And so we need to do it in a structured way that's proven to work with evidence. So what they've come up with is a single GPS. So G stands for goal setting. So identifying with the patient the change to be made. So for example, saying to your patient, right, in, um, do, in our next um, reassessment, I want your plaque score to go from 80% to 40%. Okay, so that's your goal. Then you plan with the patient to decide when, where, and how they'll undertake the behavior change. So you might say to them, right, um, for the first two weeks, I'm going to focus on the brushing, going through the technique that we went through. And then once you've got the hang of that, two weeks after, I want you to really start using the interdental brushes every day. That's your plan. Self-monitoring is encouraging the patient to assess their own behavior in relation to their goals. So you could say to them, for example, here are some disclosing tablets. Take these away with you um, so you can monitor your plaque in the meantime as well. And that's an effective way, rather than just saying to the patient, right, you're not brushing very well, you're not using TP, start using them, see you next time. Because um, it can be really difficult to actually change behavior. So I quite like GPS. Number eight, keep it simple. Um, as we know, patients only remember a little bit of what we tell them. Uh, so keep it simple to maximize the chances of your patient remembering your advice and complying. And regularly reinforce it. I cannot emphasize this enough. Oral hygiene instruction and reinforcement is not a one-off. It has to be done every single appointment um, because, of course, it's easy to forget and it's easy to, if they're getting the hang of one thing, it's easy to build on it um, rather than just saying everything at once. So regularly reinforce. Um, and finally, uh, the final tip for providing effective oral hygiene advice is emphasizing the patient's responsibility. Now, I think this is really key, especially for those patients who aren't as motivated um, as others. So when I see my patients, I always, always say to them before they accept that they don't have any active treatment, that this is a team effort. I'll do my bit, but 80% is what you do at home. Um, and it's key that the patient completely gets that from the beginning. Some, um, the image on the, the lower, uh, sorry, an image on the right side, the Love Your Gums, that's actually from an American campaign, and they've really gone far to actually promote to the patient, your gums are sort of part of you, they're your responsibility, um, and I quite like that. Some people even use consent forms, this is an example of a consent form, um, basically emphasising that the patient understands it's their responsibility um, to look after their oral health, and they'll have a role um, for treatment to be successful. So um, I think it, even if it's just a conversation, it's something that does need to be emphasized and also put in your notes as well. So 
And that's the sort of oral hygiene tips. Hope that be was useful. Any questions related to that? We'll take them now so we can um, do it a section at a time. Any questions? We've answered the question about the air floss. Is there anything else? Okay, um, implants is a whole new topic, Dahlia, but essentially, yes, you can think about implants like teeth. Um, so yes, oral hygiene is similar around implants. It's actually much more difficult to clean around implants, so you probably need to focus on it a little bit more. I find the interspace brush works really, really well, but um, it can be tricky because of the contour of the restorations and so on. So, um, But yes, essentially, you clean around it like you do around teeth. Jose, I'm sorry, what, what do you mean by eye beads? Internal brushes or? Oh, if it's internal brushes, then yes, you can use them uh, around implants. Essentially, you just think of an implant like a tooth in terms of when it comes to oral hygiene. Okay, perfect. Uh, why are TPs more resilient? I'm not sure what you mean by that, but you can get different types of TPs, some metal reinforced, some plastic reinforced, different types, um, whatever works for the patient. In terms of implant retained dentures, so for those you'll have little, normally little locators. Um, again, clean the denture as you would clean a denture, but interspace brushes are fantastic. So single tufted brushes around um, implants are fantastic and I even for perio patients but generally they're a really good tool for um, oral hygiene. Okay I'm going to move on otherwise we'll be here till midnight. Um, any further questions we can also take at the end if we've got time. So moving on to probing the second P. Um, I just wanted to go over the updated VP guidelines and um, updated last year a few important changes especially for those working in the UK. So um, we'll go through that now. First of all, um, the BP, it's your simple and rapid screening tool in practice. Um, why do we do it? Because it indicates a level of examination um, needed and the, it also gives you a basic guidance on treatment need. Now I know in other countries like the US, they go straight for a full pocket chart. So a BP is, uh, for us, is quite a nice quick screening tool. How do you do the BP? We all know how to do this. You walk it around the sulcus. One thing I would say is don't sort of put your probe in, take it out, put your probe, because it can get really painful for the patient. The best way of doing it is put it in the pocket and then gently just swipe it around the gums. It's so much more comfortable for the patient. So obviously you walk around the, the sulcus, you score um, and you have a higher score per sextant. And you do also use it in children from the age of seven where you use a simplified BP, so i.e. just scores zero, one and two, because you're just trying to differentiate between bleeding and calculus and picking up early early disease, but you do do it in children, because some people only do it in adults, but definitely can use it in children. So I've just summarized the six important changes, so we'll go through these. Number one, if you have a code four in a sextant, continue to examine all the sites in that sextant. Now, why have they changed that? Because in the past, you would get a four and then you just move on. Now, we've changed it because it gives you, if you carry on, it gives you a better understanding of the parental condition and it will also make sure that um, vocation involvements aren't missed. So that's the first thing. Number two, if you get a code three, then you actually perform initial therapy first. So initial therapy is essentially risk factor modification. So things like oral hygiene instruction, smoking cessation, a gross scale to remove chunks of calculus. Then you um, post your initial therapy, you record a pocket chart in that section only if it's appropriate. Um, so that's a change that was introduced last year. Um, a BP should not be used around implants. Instead, hopefully <laughs> you don't have a patient like this, instead um, use a four or six point pocket chart. Because a BP doesn't, and we'll sort of go into that next, but a BP doesn't really um, relates to teeth more than implants. So you need a, um, a more accurate score. So you use either a four or six point pocket chart. And generally what I do, if you're using something like SOE or um, other uh, electronic software, is then just where you normally do your BP or your pocket chart, add in another little note with the probing depths around the implants, um, because that will become key, which we'll go into um, in a minute. Number four, um, 
Radiographs should be taken for all code 3 and code 4 sextants. The type of radiograph used is a matter of clinical judgment, but crestal bone levels should be visible. Um, generally, the PA is your gold standard. However, I think the best way of doing this is just asking the question, can I see the bone? If you can't see the bone, then just take another radiograph where you will be able to see. So start off, if you're seeing normal patient in practice, bite wings. If you can see the bone, fine, done. If you can't, perhaps vertical bite wings. If you can't see the bone, perhaps PAs, or straight away a PA if there's some suggestion of other things like PA pathology, etc. So basically, use your clinical judgment, but the key is that you do need some sorts of radiographs as your special investigations. Number five, when a six-point pocket chart is indicated, it is only necessary to record sites of four millimeters and above. Um, so essentially, it's just trying to save you time here. So you can you probe around six sites. However, only when there's a four and above do you actually need to record it. And number six, bleeding on probing should always be recorded in conjunction with a six-point pocket chart. And the reason for this is because, as we know, bleeding is a real um, accurate sign of active disease and active infection. So if you're not recording that well, it doesn't give you a full clinical picture as to what's going on with the periodontal health. Um, so that's the sixth change. OK, any questions about the updated BPE? Um, <laughs> Kunal, I would hope they brush a little bit, but if they don't, then I'd say start with basics basic brushing, perhaps an electric toothbrush. Now, it's one thing to say about brushing is, if you look at the evidence, one good session of proper brushing is probably more effective than two 10 seconds of brushing. So even if you say, and that's the same with TPs, you just need one good session of interdental cleaning a day. Um, so emphasize to the patient and tell them to do it when they have the most time, either in the evening, uh, if they're rushed in the morning. Okay, so um, questions about probing. If there, is there a point of doing a six-point pocket chart for a three or four BP? So if you've got a four, you do need to do a, a pocket chart, a full pocket chart. But for a three, with a new guidance, you do initial therapy first and then do a pocket chart. Pocket charts are very important, obviously, when you've got disease to do them before treatment. Otherwise, there's no way of measuring um, how, well, how well the condition's improved or not. Um, so, Shita, when you've done your um, initial therapy, normally you review the patient about uh, 8 to 12 weeks later. So at that point, you then record the six-point pocket chart. But I'll show you a little flow chart at the end, um, which will help with sort of timelines, especially in general practice. Okay, moving on to um, probing implants. So there's this huge thing, and I don't know why, about probing implants. People in the past used to not probe them and now there's a whole thing about whether you can use a metal probe or you have to use a plastic probe and um, there's all these different controversies but the main answer to the question um, is yes you can. You can probe implants. In fact if you don't probe implants uh, you're in trouble. So number one to take away is definitely gentle probing around implants is essential. What else should you be checking? I just thought I'd add this extra slide in um, just to give you a bit more depth. So in terms of if you have a patient with implants, the same, just think of them as a perio patient. So look at their oral hygiene, look at the tone, colour, the texture of the perio implant tissues. You know, if, is there any, um, does it look inflamed? Is there any swelling, etc. Routine gentle probing is key. Um, when you probe, look out for any bleeding and suppuration. Suppuration is normally a very bad sign. Um, bleeding, um, make a note of it. Um, if there's a deep parental pocket and signs of inflammation, you may need a radiograph. You don't damage imp healthy implants by probing because you're not really going to get to the threads, which is everyone's, what, what is everyone, that's what everyone's scared about, is actually scratching those threads. So if you're probing and it's healthy, if you look at the image on the right, you're nowhere near the threads. And if it's got a huge pocket, you're definitely going to get to the threads, but it doesn't really matter if you scratch it at that point because you're going to be doing a lot more scratching when you debride it. So that's the kind of thinking behind it. And a metal probe is fine if you don't have a plastic one. So there's no um, huge deal with whatever you with what you probe with. The key thing here, just to mention, and as I said, this is another whole seminar in itself, but 
The key thing is um, noting any changes in pocket depth. So it doesn't matter if you start with maybe a five millimeter, that might be normal for that type of implant. It all depends on the implant system, you know, how it was placed, was it one stage, two stage, there's lots of different factors. But the main thing you should look out for is a change in pocket depth. So if that five then goes to a seven, then goes to a nine, then you have a problem. So just look out for the change and hence it's important to do a four or six point pocket chart around implants. Um, briefly, okay, if you get a bit of bleeding, essentially that's perimucositis. If you get bone loss around the implant, we call that peri-implantitis. And they're basically equivalent of gingivitis and periontitis. Um, but accurate diagnosis around implants is challenging. Um, so if you do, as a hygienist or as a dentist, if you haven't placed the implant and you do notice some problems, first of all, speak to the person who may have placed it um, or make a referral early because the difference between periodontitis and periimplantitis is that the condition progresses much faster around implants, so you don't have much time to catch it, so catch it early. Um, last year, I contacted Dental Protection just to get some updated figures on periolitigation and implants, and this is what they sent me back. Registrants who do not place or restore implants may see patients that have implants in situ and they could be vulnerable to a complaint or a claim if they do not diagnose in a timely manner the development of periimplantitis. So essentially what they're saying is although you didn't place the implant, it doesn't mean that you can ignore it. It's like if you have a patient and you didn't do that particular restoration, you wouldn't ignore it if it had caries. In the same way that whole patient's mouth is then your responsibility. So you do have to pick up any problems. You don't have to treat it if, you're, if it's not within your capacity, but you do, it's your responsibility to pick it up. And if you don't, you may be liable, um, as, as they've said, in de by dental protection. Okay, so any questions with regard to that? I'll just take a couple here. Um, oh, okay. Let's give it two minutes. I hope you're also enjoying your coffee in your pyjamas. Okay, so should we probe implants at least once yearly if stable? Um, in terms of the frequency, there's no real protocol. I basically probe them as I would with my perio patients, which is every three months, every six months. Um, so depends again how susceptible they are. If it is a perio patient who's had implants, I definitely do it every three months. If it's someone who's very, uh, you know, it's permanently stable, had no issues in the past, I guess a year would be fine. But every time you see them basically for a checkup, probe the implant as you would um, the other teeth. Yeah, I mean, if corhexidine works for them, um, that's absolutely fine. The main thing is that they are performing some sort of oral hygiene, which, which includes brushing around the abutment as well. Uh, oil pulling, um, not really part of probing, but will, <laughs> quite an interesting topic, actually. Um, there's not much evidence behind it. Every time, well, we all strive to perform evidence-based practice. So um, in my opinion, I don't recommend oil pulling because there's not very good evidence for it. Uh, I think what we've got already in Peri is pretty good. Um, so yeah, but it's a, it's a new thing and peri the patients love it. So uh, you have to have a, a point of view on it. Uh, I personally don't really recommend it. Okay, planing. So um, you've got your peri patient in the chair, you've done some OHI, you've done some probing, and now it's time to do some planing. Okay, planing is the wrong word, by the way. I only used it to try and fit it in with my peeling, um, but it's called debridement now. So debridement is the right term, either super gingival or sub gingival. Um, and it can be with either hand instruments or ultrasonics. So root surface debridement, so with patients with deep pockets, why do we do it? To remove subgingival plaque, calculus, and other plaque retentive factors, um, all, all in aim to try and resolve gingival inflammation and reduce pocketing. What are the indications for RSD? I just thought I'd put this in because um, it's quite important. You need a highly motivated patient who has achieved a high standard of supra and sub plaque control, but who has evidence of active disease. Basically, what's that, what that is saying is if there's a patient who's got 90% 90, 90 plaque, there's actually no point in performing root surface debridement because it's not going to work. It's better to use that time to get the oral hygiene up to scratch, hence my 
whole spiel about using plant scores. And you perform root surface debridement in any pockets that are five millimeters or more, or four millimeters with bleeding on probing. Um, or if there's presence of subgingival deposit um, in a risk patient, despite an absence of clinical signs of inflammation, you'd obviously debride that area. There's no evidence um, to say that one technique or regime is superior to another. And what I mean by that is it doesn't really matter whether you do it quadrant by quadrant or half mouth or full mouth, you know, it doesn't matter. Um, all of them are shown to be uh, similar in terms of clinical uh, evidence and clinical findings. Normally, what will be the decisive factor is just logistics, what works for the patient, what works for you in terms of appointments, but no um, procedure is better than the other. And generally, once we've performed root surface debridement, we know that we get healing and reduction in pocket depth via recession, formation of the long junction epithelium, and resolution of gingival inflammation, you get that tightening around of the cuff around the tooth. This image here is just um, to show you the power of good non-surgical debridement. So this is pre-treatment. So if I saw, even if I saw that tooth, I'd be really thinking, oh, that has a pretty guarded to hopeless prognosis, probably going to need to be taken out. But even with teeth like this, this is just from root surface debridement by Ian Chappell. Um, maybe he's got magic touch, but this is what he achieved. He even seems to be some evidence of bony infill there. So just to really emphasize the point that uh, sometimes you can get some, pro some surprising results with non-surgical debridement and do give teeth a chance. Because as we know, once you've lost the tooth, um, there's not really anything better than that. So if you do it well, it works very, very well. So just going to whiz through a few tips for hand instrumentation and then spend some time on ultrasonics because um, I think ultrasonics is what most people use in practice, if I'm not mistaken. So hand instruments, we all know the parts, the blade, the shank and the handle. Um, and essentially, we are performing a blind procedure. So having that tactile sensation and the knowledge of the root morphology is really important. You know, knowing that this particular tooth might have a groove in it and just being aware of it in your mind or thinking this is where the fication is going to be located. So you can sort of imagine it in your mind. It's a little bit like endo. Um, it's a blind procedure. So be methodical. I'm sorry, this video doesn't work, but when we upload it, we can try and get videos working as well. So be methodical. Um, Select the correct instrument, make sure you've got a good firm finger rest and a modified pen grass. I find, I teach some hygienists at Bart and um, even with the undergrads actually, I think we're all quite, um, we don't put enough force uh, when we first start doing root surface debridement and you do need a significant amount of force to perform uh, RSD effectively. So as long as you've got a, a good finger rest, you can uh, apply that force. Um, and that is important to remove all the calculus. And obviously you can use a variety of, of strokes. For example, this diagram, um, it just shows the multi-directional or cross-hatching strokes. Um, this is what I use in practice at the moment. Um, the American Eagle, they're at £48.50 uh, each. I got them when I first started my specialty training. So that was about four years ago now. So, um, and I haven't replaced them yet. They, I actually love them. Um, you don't have to sharpen them, which is great because they've got a sort of, they call it a gold, they call it a gold tip, um, essentially non-sharpening. So when they do run out of sharpness, you just replace them. But mine are still sharp. Um, so they work very effectively. I think 48 pounds is quite affordable and you can get away at the beginning of just getting the green and red one. Um, Cause one's anterior, one's posterior, they're double, cutting end, so it's, it's fantastic, this is what I use in practice. But as we know, um, most people use ultrasonics in practice, so I'm going to spend a little bit longer on this. Um, and just to say, both hand scalers and ultrasonics are effective, it doesn't mean you have to use hand scalers, I do love hand scalers, but it doesn't mean you have to. Um, but ultrasonics are actually more effective in some areas like vocation, so um, it's not a bad thing to have an ultrasonic handy. So some tips. Um, most of us, what happens is we put up the dial right to the top and have the highest power setting because we think it's going to remove all the calculus. Um, but actually, that's just going to heat up the instrument and probably even cause more damage than good. So use the lowest effective power setting. I normally keep it about halfway on the dial and then increase it as required. Pick the most appropriate tip for the tooth surface in question. So with, um, I use the cavitron, I use the piezo, as well. you can get different curvatures of the tips, different thicknesses, um, it does make a difference. 
The difference between ultrasonic and hand scalers, with a hand scaler you go down into the pocket and then debride, with the ultrasonic you start at the, um, in, where, as, as you insert into the pocket and you activate the tip, so you go coronal, down, apical, so it's a little bit different in terms of technique um, and you initiate the strokes at the gingival mar margin. Generally you use a sort of constant erasing motion if you've got big chunks of calculus and you can tap the calculus away. Use a light grasp, um, firstly because it will give you that extra tactile sensation. That's one thing you do lose with ultrasonics is that tactile sensation that you can get with hand instruments. But if you have a light grasp, that will um, enhance your tactile sensation. Um, it also allows the tip to move freely and of course it, it, it's better for you in terms of fatigue. As I said, ultrasonics are great, especially in furcations where your hand instrument might not be able to get into all the little um, areas. But one thing I have to say, um, and I did an audit recently um, with a few of my peers on looking at worn tips in practice. The majority of us have worn tips, and even a two millimeter wear on a tip will reduce the efficiency by 50%, which is huge. So if you take away anything from this webinar, if you're using ultrasonics on a daily basis, or, um, piezos, make sure you've got a good tip and it's worth investing in it. The time, although you're going to pay for that extra tip, the time you'll save, um, you'll make that back very quickly. So um, this is a wear guide that you can actually use. And what you do is you put your tip over the wear guide. And if it goes past the blue line, you're going to kind of be thinking about, mm, I might need to replace this soon. Goes past the red line, replace it. Um, especially with the slim line ones from Cavitron, once they get past that line, they also have a tendency to start breaking. So it is important to replace them. Okay, and this is this is what I use in practice, and you can get various ones for the light deposits, heavy deposits, etc. And about 125 pounds each. Last time I looked. Um, and don't forget, once you've done your debridement, you need to go back um, to check for smoothness. I generally use a VPE Pro because I find the little ball end, it will catch the calculus if there is any subcalculus left. So don't forget to check and then go back and re-instrument if you need to. Okay, questions. Um, some implant, um, Helen, thanks for your question. Some implant bridges um, are difficult to probe. Yeah, yeah, I think, Helen, it's... It, as it is, it's difficult to probe implants, even if it's not a bridge, but I completely understand. Um, those placing implants and restoring them really have a duty to try and make sure that even one part of the implant is probable. Um, so if you struggle, I would say, if you can't probe at all, I would try and find out from if the dentist who placed them is in practice can help you with that, um, because what you can do in the worst case is if it's a screw-retained bridge, you can take it off and probe it. Um, but ideally, if you can't do anything, I would record it in the notes, you may want to take a radiograph uh, in that case if it isn't probable every year or two um, and just look out for signs of inflammation. But it's not ideal if you can't probe it because that's really the only definitive way of knowing what's going on. Um, how close should your appointments be? OK, so for root surface debridement, um, I'm sorry, I've just missed one. Um, yeah, so. How, what's your opinion on how close appointments should be? I personally, although there's no uh, strong evidence for it, I do like to keep the treatment appointments as close as possible. Um, so if there's half map, I'll try to do it within two weeks or so. But to be honest, as long as you don't spread it out for months and months, there's no real, um, you know, there's no real evidence today. You can't sit evidence to suggest you can't spread them out. So whatever works with your patient. If you want to do it all in one day, then if it works with the patient and it's suitable clinically, then that's absolutely fine. Uh, perio chip, um, if we go through all these questions, we may not have time to finish the webinar, but just briefly, I don't use perio chip. Uh, essentially, the um, although some studies show it's statistically significant, the clinical significance that you get in terms of improvement is, um, is not really significant. So I don't tend to use it. I know some people do use it in cases where they've tried everything and it's a last resort, but I don't, I don't use perio chip. Um, what would you do for a patient who has codes four when you have sent multiple appointments go through it? Yeah. Well, that's the whole point. Rebecca, your question. If you've got objective plaque scores and um, you feel like you're not going to be able to provide, your treatment's not going to work because of the high plaque scores, as long as you've got an objective measurement, you can decline patients. And then those types of patients, they've got active periodontity, sometimes um, 
you just have to say, right, we're going to put your maintenance see you every three months with the hygienist and just keep things going, prevent it from getting worse. But any active treatment uh, can't really be justified. In fact, I don't think it's even ethical to do active treatment unless you're being able to predict um, predict the result. And that will be in a case where they've got good oral hygiene. OK, um, ultrasonics, yes, you can, um, but it depends what the conditions like. If they don't have any problems, you don't use ultrasonics. If they do have perimplantitis, ultrasonics are useful. Um, I can probably do another webinar on that, so I, I will move on. So um, going on to the prescribing section. So I just thought I'd include this because there's also some confusion of when to prescribe antimicrobials. And at the moment, um, you know, you think, oh, should I do it? Should I not? If I do think I should prescribe, what should I be, pres be prescribing um, for the for various types of perio cases? And really, the balance at the moment um, that should be crossing your mind is, yes, I want to be a really good dentist and try and save all these teeth and cure all this perio. But there's obviously the huge a downside of antibiotic resistance, which is getting more and more topical now, and more and more important, always seeing it on the news. So it's a balance between trying to provide good dental care, but also making sure as a healthcare provider who's able to prescribe, to make sure we do our responsibility to prescribe appropriately. So it's sort of this balance. So when do we actually prescribe? Now, the evidence here is a little bit grey, uh, as it is with many things. And this was another consensus workshop that was carried out by the EFP. And essentially what they said was, all patients actually benefit from antimicrobials, um, antibiotics. All patients can benefit. However, it would be a bit unwise to start giving all our patients antibiotics because of the thing about resistance, because of risks of allergy. It's lots of different negatives to it. So you wouldn't give it to every single patient. So you have to be selective. And then they mention that the types of patients that may benefit are patients with severe, aggressive, active, refractory periodontitis. Now that is also very vague. So as so, um, during my training and my peers and other the other specialists that I know, uh, generally when they give um, um, one time when they always give or nearly always give antimicrobials is for aggressive periodontitis. And personally, they're the types of patients where I really think, oh, I'm definitely going to prescribe here. Or a patient with no risk factors, severe perios, just not responding to patient, just not responding to treatment, I may then give it in that um, time as well. But not all your patients, so be selective. How? It's always, always, always as an adjunct to root surface debride. You can't just give it, um, you know, patient comes in, they've got some para, give them the, the antibiotics and off they go and come back for RSD next time. You always, always have to instrument the pocket because if you don't disturb the biofilm, your antimicrobial won't get to the site. So you have to do it as an adjunct. And usually it's on the last session of your debridement. Okay, so if you're doing quadrant by quadrant or half mouth, it will be on your last session. If you are doing full mouth, there's, um, some people do start it on the day, before, on the actual morning of the appointment. Doesn't matter, but generally it will be on your last session. There's no optimum protocol for what in terms of what to use. The most evidence for perio is with amoxicillin and metronidazole. Um, and that's sort of the cocktail that's been pushed in the evidence more and more. However, it, there's nothing to say that that's optimum compared to other options. So what are the kind of options that you can use? So with amoxicillin and metronidazole, According to the FGDP guidelines that were recently updated, um, just after the BNF was published, the latest BNF, so it's not included in there, um, they said that you need to use the highest dose. So now the guidelines are 500 milligrams of moxicillin, TDS, 400 milligrams of metronidazole, TDS, for up to five days, and at reviewing it at three days. So essentially your dose is for five days, 500 milligrams, 400 milligrams, three times a day, and that's the, the new recommended dose if you're going to be using that particular regime. I very, this is my new favorite antimicrobial, azithromycin. I don't know if you are using it in practice. Interesting to know if you are actually and what sort of results you're getting because I started using this a couple of years ago and I absolutely love it. One of the main reasons why I love it is because you only need to take one tablet for three days. So compliant is so easy. So for the patient, you know, if they don't want to take six tablets for five days this is one tablet for three days very very easy in terms of compliance so and i'm getting fantastic results with it so i really love azithromycin um it'll be interesting to see what the research and evidence shows in the next few years 
So um, worth trying that if you haven't already. Okay. Um, any questions about antibiotics? Um, whilst we're waiting, Yvonne, I'll ask your, answer your question on anaesthesia for RSD. Um, I generally do, unless it's a patient who just doesn't want it. I personally feel comfortable when the patient's numb, I can perform really good at RSD, so I generally do encourage it uh, for deep pockets. So over five, six millimeter pockets and over that, I would definitely give um, LA. Um, there are other options, like there's a thing called Auroquix, you can just squirt it into the pocket. I don't use that, but some people say it works really well. So, but ideally for deep pockets, you do want to numb up what you can. Um, doxycycline you can use as well. Uh, I don't like it because it's such a long regime, but essentially you have 200 milligrams as your loading dose and 100 milligrams um, as your do dose after that, normally for 21 days. That's quite exten extensive. Okay, so moving on to the last section. So planning. Um, I thought I'd just share a few treatment planning tips um, and also cover in terms of claiming on the NHS. So this is the shard and um, they planned this uh, a little while ago where I'm doing my training at Guy so I can see shard all the time. So I was just doing a bit of reading about it and the time they spent um, planning it, well 60% of their time they spent planning the actual building. Um, they actually spent 30% of the time sequencing it and then only 10% of the time executing it. And when the shard was actually made, there were only 11 amendments that had to be made. That is like absolutely nothing for such a huge building project to only have 11 amendments. That was phenomenal. And the reason why was because most of the time was spent in planning and sequencing it. Only 10% was on execution. Most of the time was in planning it. So what I wanted to, ta uh, to take from this is that we need to plan well. All our treatment needs to be planned well, whether it's oral hygiene, whether it's the sequence of appointments, whether it's you know what the patient's bringing to the appointments, everything, when you're going to review them, the whole long-term plan, plan well, um, because if you don't, you'll be tripped up by things which you missed out, um, and obviously the, your, your treatment may not be as, as successful as it might have been. So number one, always treatment plan well, spend that extra time going through things, double checking your notes, double checking your radiographs, um, really important. This is also the shard, as you can see, is the tallest building there. Um, but I don't know if you know, but the shard is actually still half empty. Um, and the reason for that is, and the reason for what they think is, is, um, is because it was built on the wrong side of the river. It should have really be built on the other side and it would be buzzing. But at the moment it's half empty. So what I want you to take away from this is that always take a look at the bigger picture. Okay, your patient is not just a set of teeth and gums, as you know, they have a life, they have a job, they may be on shift work, they may have five children, they may have other health problems and priorities. Take that into account, because if you don't, some, most of the stuff that you also advice that you give them may not work or some things might not be appropriate. So always look at the bigger picture with your patients. Number three, identify modifiable risk factors from the outset. So always do a thorough history. Look at the medical history. Do they have diabetes? If they have diabetes, how well controlled it is, is it? And don't just get a, let the patient get away by saying, yes, I've got well controlled diabetes, because most of your patients will say that, even if they don't. Uh, the thing to look for is your HbA1c level. Ask them for the percentage, or now it's changed to millimole per litre. So look, look at the stability from, again, an objective point of view. Because as we know, if, for example, if they're diabetic, if they're poorly controlled, that's going to have a huge influence on your treatment. You know, you, they could be coming back again and again after active causes and you're wondering, oh my God, my root surface debridement is not working. All those tips that I got from Rena, then they're rubbish, they're not working, I'm not getting any good results. But actually, it might just be the diabetes. So don't miss those obvious risk factors. Um, also with diabetes, and the reason why I put this image here is because when you might have a relative or someone with diabetes, it's actually a really difficult condition to cope with in terms of what the, sort of the compliance that's required. You know, when do I have my medication? Which medication is it? When do I eat? 
oh, have I been to my um, eye appointment, my diabetic foot ulcer, how's that going? They have a lot on their mind. So we have to really try and work with them to try and promote good oral hygiene and compliance to treatment rather than sort of having a go at them for not doing things because they have a lot on their plate already. So try and work with these types of patients. I'm also mentioning smoking here because as we know, that's a huge, probably the most important environmental risk factor. Dose dependent response, do not forget to get a good smoking history, even if they're not smoking now. What would they smoke before? How many? For how long? Um, so don't forget your smoking history. And vaping, I just thought I'd include this because it's very topical. Um, what do we know about vaping? Well, that still should be part of your social history when you ask them the question about smoking. Add an extra question. Do you vape? Do you use anything like that? Vaping generally um, has been shown to be better for your general health, has been shown to help smokers quit smoking as well. The effects on gingival health or parental health are not really known at the moment. Um, so my advice on it when I speak to my patients is that's great if it's helping you stop smoking, but eventually we need to go to zero. Number four, in terms of treatment planning, make sure you make a complete diagnosis. So when we have our consultant clinics in the hospital, we see lots of referrals and oftentimes we forget to make a complete diagnosis. And this is really important, both when you're referring, but also when you're doing treatment in practice. So essentially, there's really just three components to a diagnosis. Number one, whether it's generalized or localized. Number two, it's severity, so mild, moderate, or severe. And you can use you can use different things like you can use pocket depths, clinical attachment loss, or radiographs, or sort of bone levels to see the severity. And then finally, is it chronic or is it aggressive? Because as we know, if it's aggressive, your treatment approach may be a little bit different to that what it would be for chronic patients. So you do need to identify which one. Briefly, you know, aggressive patients, they're patients with no um, risk factors, so medically fit and well. Sometimes they have a family history of the condition, but importantly, it's rapid attachment loss. The risk factors don't really uh, aren't really commensurate with the amount of attachment loss they've got. Interestingly enough, age has been taken out of the classification for aggressive now. So you can have a 50 year old aggressive just because you know they're not 30 doesn't mean that they, they're not allowed to have aggressive. Just we say that it's more common in younger patients because you know they've got a rapid attachment loss. So by that time, if you're 30 and you've got 60-70% uh, bone loss, that's rapid attachment loss, but essentially any aged person can have aggressive. To confuse things more, you can actually go between aggressive and chronic, so you could have aggressive for a few years and then it would stabilise and you can have chronic, so it is confusing and um, it is important to have a complete diagnosis. Number five, speak the patient's language. Um, when I started off my peri training, I always used to say to the patient, right, you know, I really want to make sure we do this treatment successful. I want to make sure you're on board so I can get all your pocket depths down to four millimeters and below and stop all the bleeding on probing. But patients find that really difficult to relate to. So one thing which is great to do is when you have the conversation about treatment planning and what you recommend to your patients, put it in their own language. So for example, by doing this active treatment and root surface debridement, it will mean that you can keep your teeth for longer and not have to wear those not have to wear any dentures or after you've lost your teeth. It will mean that you won't have that bad breath or wake up with blood on your pillow. Those are the patient related sort of quality of life essentially questions, um, factor that you should be relating back to the patient rather than, you know, a decrease in pocket deaths because they can't really relate to that. Um, so especially, you know, when you're doing private, private period and patients aren't accepting your treatment plans, Try and put it in their terms so they really understand, because once they understand how important it is to have good parental health, um, people will be willing to pay for this to get healthier. You know, if you, for example, okay, just to give you a quick example. If you were going on holiday, it's freezing cold here in England, and I'd love to go away somewhere hot. Okay, say I, since say you were going to go away, and something happened to your toe, and you hurt the toe, and it went all black, um, and you're just about to go on holiday where you're going to wear flip flops. You went to see someone about it and they said, right, it's going to be X amount of money to get it sorted. You would pay that because that's a part of your body that's gone horrible and black and it needs to be, you know, it needs to be fixed. OK, same thing, you know, when you have a carous cavity, that's a rotting part of your body. And you, when patients understand the implications of what it actually is, they will pay for it. So in the same way, you have to just relate it in terms of patient um, for the patient to understand. Number six, discuss the prog uh, prognosis. 
Prognosis is often missed out because of lack of time, but it is really important because your patient needs to know if a particular tooth has a guarded prognosis, that treatment might not be fully successful. Or if a tooth has a hopeless prognosis, you recommend it be extracted. And patients need to get an idea that what their prognosis is going to be like rather than everything, yep, we do the treatment, everything's going to work really well. So always give your patient an idea of prognosis. So you can get both a periodontal prognosis and an overall prognosis. So you can separate them, so you can give a periodontal prognosis or you can just give an overall restorative sort of prognosis. And generally, there's various categories. This is what the one that I use, which is good. Obviously, good is fine, that tooth's going to be there forever. Fair is something maybe with four or five million pocket anterior tooth, you'll quite, um, you know, quite predictably get it down and healthy. And that would be a fair prognosis. Guarded, questionable, poor is anything like a grade two fabrication involvement, a bit of mobility, not really sure how it's going to respond. Hopeless is that you recommend it be extracted straight away. So that's hopeless. So always give patients an idea of prognosis. Number seven, um, know when to refer. This is quite key. So when do you actually refer? Well, you refer cases for specialist, specialist care when you feel uncomfortable in managing it alone. And that could be because of the extent or it could be because of the severity or complexity. And this is where litigation also comes in. It's much easier for a patient to allege after an event that they would have preferred a referral for specialist care. So always offer it to them um, from the outset. And even if they refuse, make sure you offer it to them again at the next appointment and record it in your notes. Minimise any delay. And if you're from um, you know, England and you follow the BSP guidelines, they've actually created some useful guidelines on when they advise referral. And essentially, those guidelines are divided into three complexities, um, and complexity three is normally recommended for referral, either to a private practice or to the hospital, it doesn't matter. But have a look at those. If it's a, um, uh, you're referring just to a, a specialist in practice, or you really just need to include some of the main details. Some, when patients, when I get referred patients, I really just say, give me their name, details, one sentence, make it quite easy. Um, but it's not much of a requirement if you're referring practice. However, in hospital, as you probably know, um, it's a little more uh, difficult to get accepted. So what can you do to actually maximise your chance of being accepted in hospital? First of all, include every single thing possible. OK, because I've seen the consultants go through referrals and I've seen how they work. And if you, for example, don't have one, you have one thing missing, like you're missing a pocket chart, that's a straight rejection. So by maximising, include all the details, all the documents, all your pocket charts, all your radiographs, show that you've attempted to treat for your chronic patients at least. Um, and really, the acceptance depends, quite frankly, on the hospital workload. If they can take more patients, they will, and they'll be less rigid in terms of acceptance. Um, but if they're overloaded, they'll be more picky in terms of what they accept. Um, however, the referral pathways are improving because it's. I think that the, the thing is everyone wants to have a, the same acceptance criteria for all, at least all the London hospitals. Um, so they are improving, and this is a sneak preview of sort of the form that they're going to start using for all the the hospitals in London at least. So just a simple form, fill it in, um, and hopefully it will be more you'll be it'll be more predictable whether your patient's going to be accepted or not. So number eight, okay, coming to the end, um, understanding how to claim on the NHS. I just thought I'd put this section because I get quite a few questions about when to claim band one, when to claim band two, what's allowed, what's not allowed. Um, so we'll briefly go through that. So as you know, Band one essentially is a clinical examination and any advice that you give to your patients as well as a scale and polish. Band two is actually performing active treatment like non-surgical periodontitis and if you do do surgery um, on the NHS then that would also be included here. And band three there's no period. So essentially band one is prevention and band two is treatment. Just remember those two simple things. So according to the NHS dental charges regulations there's no time sort of bars between the courses of treatment. There's no stipulation on the number of visits, and you just really can provide what is clinically necessary. So what does that actually mean in terms of band one or two? So there's no requirement that you have to perform band two over X number of visits. There's no requirement for you to spend X amount of time on band two or um, even the actual indices that you perform. 
the problem was before 2006 and the, the contract that was then present, people used to start splitting courses, um, obviously to get new UDAs. And that's where this whole hoo-ha came about is why, you know, when can you claim, when can you not? But essentially, if you want to claim a band two, it can be carried out in two visits. If you really wanted to, you could do your exam in one visit and then your OHI in four months of in two visits. So it can technically be done in two visits or more realistically, you split over your RSD over several appointments. You then review your patients normally at three months post treatment. And then at the review, OK, you claim a band one if the patient's responded well or a further band two. OK, so once you've done your treatment, you actually close off your course. Then when you reassessment, that's your new course of treatment. If they've responded and you don't need any treatment, well, that's just an exam. So that's band one. If you need to do more treatment, that becomes a band two. So something which is key, um, and it's the same for pilots or prototypes, something which is key is good communication with your patient. Because essentially, if you're a patient and you've got periodontitis, you may need several band twos, you need to pay for several band twos over the year. So warn your patients about that so they don't think you're just trying to claim more money from them. Um, that's how it works at the moment. So because people got so confused about this, um, Len and I, Len's a medical legal advisor, also my boss, um, and but he knows the contract inside out. So he came up with this flowchart, which is on my blog, which is quite helpful, um, hopefully, in terms of when to claim for band one, band two, and sort of the, the flow of your treatment. So have a look at that. It will be on, it is on the, the site at the moment. Okay, and then finally, um, well, maintaining good clinical records is essential. And this webinar is recorded and it will be on, on, on um, the website after. So have a look at some of these phrases and pick out, um, if you want the slides, I can email them to you. Um, just contact me through my blog. But you can essentially pick out some of these words or phrases to put in your templates. And hopefully you're using templates as clinical notes. But some of these are great. And it's actually taken from um, a pack that was made in Manchester called Healthy Gums Do Matter. And it's a fantastic tool. And um, some of these things like, just things like advised patients of mild, moderate or advanced disease, just giving the patient a diagnosis and putting it in your notes is key, especially when it comes to litigation. Things like um, patient advised that oral hygiene is not adequate to support formal parallel therapy, advised needs to improve oral hygiene, etc, etc. Um, patient advised that the best outcome after treatment will be when they have low plant scores, excellent oral hygiene and stop smoking. So things like that, it's really important. I'm sure we all have the conversations with our patients and then probably run out of time to put it in our notes. If you've got some phrases saved in your templates, you can just pop them in as necessary. And uh, it's a useful reminder as well when you're dealing with these patients. So have a look at this anyway in your own time. OK, so um, just over an hour. Um, but essentially, we've spoken about PLAC, okay, the importance of giving good oral hygiene advice in practice, especially when you're limited with time, and why it's so important. Probing in terms of both your updated BP guidelines as well as probing your implants. Planning how to perform effective, or, uh, effective root surface debridement in your patients, whether you're using hand instruments or ultrasonics. Prescribing, giving an idea of when to prescribe, what to prescribe. And planning, essential for successful periodontal uh, treatment outcomes in practice. So um, give it another couple of minutes. We'll take some questions. Whilst the questions um, are coming in, um, I, there is an ebook that I've made, and that's also on my blog that you can have a look at. And it's basically a much more detailed version of this webinar with various other um, sections as well. So have a look if you like. Um, it's all free, downloadable. Um, that's the, my website, my blog, if you want to connect on there on social media as well, um, I'd be happy to if you email me, I'm happy to send you the slides, but this will be recorded and put online as well, so uh, hopefully that will be good. Um, okay, so some final questions now, the last sort of five minutes. Um, just wait for a couple of minutes. So, so four millimeter pocket, um, Bleeding and bleeding on probing. Generally, the advice is if it's four millimeters and below, that's fine. You're stable and you can put them on maintenance. If there's bleeding associated with that, generally you would re debride that. However, there are patients in practice where you would then say, even if they've got a five millimeter in some areas, 
you will say, right, you know, I'm not going to achieve much more with non-surgical debridement. Surgery is not really net, um, appropriate. Then you can accept those pockets and maintain them. Maintain them means that you want to keep them maintenance, to prevent them from getting any worse. There may be occasions where they all, some a larger relapses, and then you need active treatment. But there's you don't have to get every single pocket down from four millimeter below with no bleeding on probing for the for the patient to go into maintenance. Sometimes you have to be realistic um, about when you put them onto uh, undergoing supportive parental therapy. So that's a really good question, actually. How often should RSD be performed? Um, well, you perform it anytime you need to, um, but you'd review it normally about eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks after you've performed it. And then you do your pocket chart. And if you still have pockets, you could do the root surface debridement. But if you're continually doing that and not getting any changes, you have to take a step back and think, why am I not seeing the improvements? Is there a local factor? Is there a potentially need for surgery here? Uh, looking, at, looking at the anatomy, is there risk factors you haven't identified? So it's not like there's a limit on RSD, but technically, if you're, if you're doing it again and again and again, not getting good results, you have to take a step back and see why and try and justify why and then addressing those factors. Um, so Lydia, similar, if pockets persisting around seven meters but not bleeding, do you eventually go into maintenance? If you think that no other treatment is appropriate and you're not getting any further improvement, you know, surgery is not appropriate, etc., pocket reduction surgery um, is not appropriate, then you can accept that. But seven, uh, the evidence shows that there's a huge jump when you get to a six millimeter pocket from a five that there is a huge chance of that progressing. So if you are going to accept it and put them on maintenance, make sure you keep them on close maintenance. You know, to every two to three months, you might, want, you might want to see them just to double check. But yes, I think you have to look at it um, patient factors and look at it as an individual case by case basis. Okay, just the last minute. Uh, number two, bleed it. So, um, Bleeding will be absent in smokers, so how can you manage it? Although bleeding will be absent, um, you still if they've got periodontitis, they'll have pockets. So then um, make sure you obviously address, you treat those deep pockets. But also it's a good thing to say to patients that are smokers, because they might think they've got healthy gums because they're not bleeding, to actually inform them and educate them that because you're, because you're a smoker, you may not have those apparent signs of bleeding because all your blood vessels are constricted. And so when you do cut down and hopefully stop, you may notice an increase in bleeding, but that's because it was masked beforehand. So that's, that's a really good point and a good conversation to have with patients. Um, Lydia, so yes, if it's a if you're um, referring to that patient with a seven millimeter, I would say then if you're going to accept that because you can't think you can improve on that, I would say yes. Every time you see them on maintenance, I would do a pocket chart for those types of patients. Um, Jagdi, uh, if you're on maintenance, is it a band one or two? So basically, just think: is it an exam? If you're only doing an exam, then that's band one. If you have to do some debridement in itself, then that's band two. Um, do also try and involve your hygienist as well. If you've got a hygienist in practice, absolute asset. So try and work with them and a good time to actually refer your patients is when they're well, not only for active treatment, but for maintenance, it's great to involve the hygienist. Okay, so thank you very much. I'm gonna to have to wrap up, um, but thank you so much for your time today. I hope it was useful. Um, great dedication to be on a perio webinar on a Monday evening. Um, I hope the uh, recording will be online for those who couldn't join us as well. Hope you're still enjoying watching this afterwards. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can connect as well on social media and enjoy the rest of your evening. Thank you. Thank you for the lovely comments. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, everyone. I'm going to log off.